follow me. Take up his cross and follow me. Whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake, the same will save it, the same will save it. What profit is it to a man, what profit to a man to gain the world and lose his soul, to gain the world and lose his soul. saves his life will lose it. Whoever saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake, the same will save it. The same will save it. Take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross and follow me. If anyone would follow me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross and follow me. Good evening and welcome. I, along with the graduating class of 2024, welcome you to this special occasion is a milestone in maybe just a number of ways this evening. It's a milestone to be graduating, but it's also maybe a testament to the goodness and grace of God who welcome you to the 30th commencement exercises of Faith Builders Christian School. It's good to gather with family and church and friends. and It's an evening of celebration, an evening of sending off seven young people. We desire to worship the Lord as we celebrate together. This year, our school theme was Be Still and Know That I'm God, and it was taken from Psalm 46. And I invite you to listen as I read this passage that we've read many times in school this year. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar, and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. Just at the break of dawn, nations raged, kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. And tonight we just want to recognize the gift of God who is with us, who is for us, who will help us. Come behold the work of the Lord in the lives of young people. He has faithfully worked in each of us, even as he has worked faithfully 
in your lives. John Mark Coons will lead us in an invocational prayer, after which Kyle Lehman will lead us in a congregational song. Let's pray. Lord, this evening we bow with grateful hearts. We're grateful tonight for seven young people who are celebrating the end of one chapter in their lives and the beginning of a new one. We're grateful for the gift that these young people have been to FBCS over the years they've been here. We're grateful for the gifts that you've given them through their families, through the community, through what they've received here. Most of all, Lord, we're grateful for your promise to walk with them if they will walk with you. And tonight, we ask your blessing on them. We ask tonight that you be with us as we celebrate this milestone with them. We ask that you would bless this evening and bless these people. In your name I pray. Amen. Please stand and turn to your song sheets in your bulletin.
One of our long-standing traditions here in this school is that each of our graduates gets a chance to speak to us this evening. They've chosen a topic that they have been thinking about or especially care about or that marks something really important to them personally. So I look forward to hearing from you. On Friday, March 15, during an exceptionally intense game of dodgeball, I went to throw a ball at an opponent, but instead struck my hand on his foot. Although rather painful, I decided that I was all right. However, when several ibuprofen and a weekend fishing trip failed to heal, I went to the emergency room on the following Monday. There it was discovered that I had broken my hand. Although not a serious injury, it did mean that I would need to wear a cast for about five weeks and would have very limited movement of my right hand. Everyday activities such as writing, buttoning a shirt, tying my shoes, and taking a shower quickly became arduous. In those five weeks, when I was forced to rely on the help of others more than ever, I came to realize that we as humans were not designed to be alone and that dependency is a necessary part of every relationship. Today's Western world holds up independence and self-reliance as two of the greatest virtues. Society tells us that dependency is weakness and that all that we need to succeed is greater trust in our own abilities. This Lone Ranger mentality has captured the modern man, leaving him lonely and depressed when he realizes that he cannot do everything on his own. When God created Adam, he realized that it was not good for him to be alone, but that he needed a helper. Not only was Adam dependent on Eve and vice versa, but they were both dependent on God. Modern humans are no different. Our belief that we can do better on our own flies directly in the face of God's word. By removing ourselves from community through a belief that we can handle our problems on our own, we not only injure ourselves, but also the people around us who need us just as much as we need them. As I move into life outside of school, I want to foster healthy dependencies on the people around me, and most importantly, on Christ. As radio commentator Paul Harvey once said, the spirit of interdependence will not cost us more than it's worth. On the steep slope ahead, holding hands is necessary. And it just might be that we can learn to enjoy it. Matthew 22, 37 to 39 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. As I read this passage, I had to wonder why God would call us to do something that seems so impossible. I mean, how do you love everyone? We all have someone that we struggle to connect with or we don't really get along with and we drag our feet when it comes to having conversations with them. So how do we love those people? A phrase that stole my attention one Sunday morning was, when we judge others, it's because we're not loving God enough. He was speaking about judgment during that sermon, but I think it also applies to loving others. Think about it. When are the times that you struggle the most with loving those around you? For me, it's when my relationship with God is weak. The children's song, J-O-Y, has it right when it says, Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. Not only should we love God above all others, as Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven says, but everything that we do, our actions, our thoughts, are all signs of what our relationship with God is like. When I don't have time with God, when I don't pray, when I don't worship God, those are the times when I struggle the most to truly love my neighbors as I should. My relationship with God should always take precedence over all the business of life. 
Ephesians 2.10 2, says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. God created every single person with a purpose, and that purpose is to love. Too often I look at the world with eyes that see me at the center and others just existing around me. But a lot of good can happen when I take off those blinders. And I pray as I walk into the next stage of life that I have eyes that see needs, hands that provide support, and a heart that offers love to everyone around me. Born without arms or legs, Nick Vujicic faced extreme challenges from a very young age. Growing up with only two feet attached directly to his torso, he experienced intense bullying and discrimination, which left him feeling isolated and hopeless. He struggled with depression at a young age and at one point unsuccessfully attempted to drown himself. In the following years, Nick changed the course of his life by changing his perspective on his circumstances. Through his resilience and relentless efforts, Nick overcame his disabilities and learned to swim, surf, and golf using only his feet. Despite his physical limitations, Vujicic has become one of the world's leading motivational speakers. When asked how he manages to be happy despite having no arms or legs, Nick replied, the quick answer is that I have a choice. I can be angry about not having limbs, or I can be thankful that I have a purpose. I choose gratitude. Nick chose a positive response in face of his unchangeable circumstances, and this same choice is before each one of us. Each day, we can choose how we respond to the uncontrollable events that come our way. In my 12 years at school, I've had countless opportunities to practice this. For example, it might rain on a day when I desperately want to play outside, then the history lesson drags on for what feels like hours. Then someone forgets to plug in the roaster, so I have a cold lunch. And then maybe the class before recess goes extra long, so we have a short recess. And this list could go on. These are clearly very insignificant issues, but in the moment when they feel so important to me, I have a decision to make. I quickly default to being grumpy, complaining, and negative. But there's another option. Rather, I can choose to respond with a positive attitude and gratefulness. Your reaction to the small incidents in your life has far-reaching effects. By fostering a positive, grateful response in small difficulties, we prepare ourselves to respond positively in the significantly challenging circumstances of life. Every one of us has uncontrollable circumstances in our life every day. The choice then lies before us. Will you respond with a negative, entitled, complaining mindset, or will you choose positivity and gratefulness? Will your response be focused on how your circumstances cause you discomfort, or will you turn to Jesus and look for ways that he is shaping you through this experience? As I go from here, I challenge myself and I challenge you to respond to the unchangeable circumstances of your life each day with positivity and gratefulness, trusting in God who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Loving God is one of the most important command God gives his people, but second to it is to serve others. In Matthew 22, a Pharisee asks Jesus what the greatest commandment is. Jesus responds, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these commandments hang all the law and prophets. Service is key to following God's commandments. Serving is one of the most effective ways to spread God's light and build a God-following community. Truly serving others requires giving up ourselves and taking up the cross. It requires laying down our wants and desires in the place of our neighbor's wants and desires. 
Jesus modeled for us the perfect example of service. He came to a broken and hungry world and spent his life in service to humankind. He never tried to elevate his status with the miracles he was performing. He was focused solely on everyone else. As humans, we crave relationships and community that can support us. Service builds communities with strong ties. Serving others means investing in others' lives and wanting what's best for them. Furthermore, people thrive on relationships, and serving others creates deep relationships. When many people invest in each other, a strong community is created, strengthened by their desire to serve those around them. However, on the flip side, living in a larger community like ours can lead to a lack of service because of a mentality of someone else can do it. This goes directly against God's commandment, which says our priority is to love our neighbors. Service unifies and brings people together. Self-focus slowly erodes the soil in which the roots of unity are embedded. Our world today is an example of this. We experience deep values of independence, focusing on oneself, and attempting to lift oneself above everybody else. That life ends up being lonely and unsatisfactory because we know deep down inside that we were created to serve others, not ourselves. Because of this, the act of serving others is an incredible light to the world. It breaks down barriers and creates the trust that an independent world struggles to feel. Serving encourages people and lets them know that you love and care about them. A primary way we love God is by serving others. Jesus said that loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength is the greatest commandment, and the second is to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is a serious commitment as it requires laying down ourselves and taking up the cross. However, in comparison to Jesus literally taking up the cross, it can hardly compare with his sacrifice. My desire is to be a true child of God by following Jesus' commandment to love God by serving others, and I urge you to join me. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. In a society that emphasizes independence and self-centeredness, we as Christians ought to take the command of Hebrews seriously. As fallen people, we are predisposed with a selfish nature. We can easily fall into the mindset of caring only for ourselves without realizing. We need to make a conscious effort to live out this principle of caring and showing compassion for those around us. Caring takes the focus off of ourselves and shifts it to the people around us. Showing kindness and concern for others helps us beat back and bring under control our self-centeredness. When we focus on showing compassion, it changes our very thinking. We no longer think in the manner of, what's best for ourselves? Rather, what's best for those around us? The focus on compassionate living includes even small things, like just being friendly to everybody you meet, helping people in times of need, or putting effort into everything that you do. In order to care, we must also make serving others a priority. This does mean that you will have to make sacrifices at some point for other people, but the reward for doing this is far greater than the cost of the sacrifice. Serving others influences them in the right way, while it also grows our habit of showing compassion. This plays itself out in our attitudes. Caring cultivates a positive attitude in us that spreads to others. And while caring cultivates a positive attitude, having a positive attitude can also help us care for others. Cultivating a positive attitude helps us lift others up instead of tearing them down with our words and actions. In order to fully follow Jesus' teachings, we must be caring, compassionate people. As I made this a priority for my final year in school, I noticed significant changes from my focus and attitude. When you live this out, people naturally will feel your care 
and will be influenced to do the same. I believe this includes simple and hard things, but I know our investments in each other's lives will be rewarded both by those people and by God. As people who want to follow God's teachings, we are commanded to be caring to those around us, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By the sixth grade, I knew that I disliked softball. It made us lose recess time because it took so long to get down to the fields, it hardly involved any exercise, and my feet always felt gross and dirty after playing. But the main reason I disliked it so much was that I was very bad at it. And since I was bad at it, I never tried very hard for fear of embarrassing myself. I always told whoever was setting up the team to put me in right field or wherever the least action would be because I was afraid of missing a catch or not being able to throw far enough. But then, when I was in ninth grade, my older sister told me something that changed my whole perspective. She said, it's better to like things. She went on to explain that I was missing out if I didn't like something. I just had to fix my attitude and I could have fun doing almost anything. I realized then that because of my bad attitude, I was making my life a lot more miserable than it needed to be. So the next time we played softball, I decided to try my best and try to have fun, even though my best might not be very good and I might make a fool out of myself. I had a really good time that day. I'm sure I missed catches and probably looked generally uncoordinated and clueless, but no one really cared. It was a lot more fun playing where I actually got to try to catch the ball sometimes, rather than moping around in the outfield. That game of softball was one of the first times I realized the magic of simply having a good attitude. We all think children are great for being so enthusiastic about basically everything, but after we pass a certain age, most of us lose that enthusiasm to our insecurities about ourselves. What we don't realize is that people actually think we're wonderful when we get excited about things, and more importantly, God thinks it's wonderful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to rejoice always, not just when we're doing something we like. By having a good attitude, I was able to have a lot more fun playing softball, which before I had hated. I began trying to do everything with a better attitude, and my life became a lot happier. I began trying new things, even though I knew I might not be good at them or enjoy them right away. Often, I found I could have fun doing things that I wasn't good at, just by improving my attitude toward them. Although I still occasionally revert to my former ways and spoil my day by having a bad attitude, I realize now that my sister's simple yet profound phrase has changed my life for the better. Her advice reminds me, and I hope it can remind you too, that it's better to like things. Seventy years ago, Harvard professor Dr. Kurt Richter performed an intriguing experiment. In this experiment, Richter placed rats in a bowl of water to see how long they could stay afloat. On average, each rat would give up and begin to sink after about 15 minutes. But right before the rats gave up from exhaustion, the researchers would pluck them from the water, dry them off, let them rest for a few minutes, and then drop them back in the water. In this second round of the experiment, how long do you think the rats lasted? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Another 15 minutes? 60 hours. That's right, 60 hours of swimming. The conclusion drawn was that since the rats believed that they would eventually be rescued, they were able to push their bodies far past what they originally thought possible. They were committed to survival and were unwilling to give up as long as there was a chance of rescue. 
While rats aren't necessarily models to imitate, in this experiment, they give a perfect example of the kind of unwavering commitment that we all need. Even in our pampered lives in 21st century America, we can find ourselves stuck and in seemingly hopeless situations, whether it's something small like a project that isn't coming together or something much larger like a relationship that seems to be hopelessly falling apart. No matter the case, if we keep our focus on the task at hand and believe in our end goal, we can do far more than we might think possible. Even when life is easy and smooth, commitment is still necessary for us to grow and live godly lives. I've found in my personal experience that when I start getting lazy and don't stay committed to maintaining relationships, I see those start to fail. When I stop spending regular time with God, I find myself backsliding, all because I become passive and lose sight of what I'm working towards. And although it is possible to be committed to a false hope, we know that as Christians, our commitment to live our lives according to Jesus is well-founded because God's promises are sure. And so I challenge myself and all of you to stay committed to God and the task at hand so that when the time comes, we can well and truly echo the Apostle Paul and say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith.
forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Be strong. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful music, very touching. Thank you, graduates, for those words. It was good to hear from you. Tonight, we're very happy to have Mr. Lehman here with us. You know, it's interesting, this is the 30th commencement exercises, and that had been back in his first years here. And um, I find that interesting that as a grandfather of two of our graduates and a pastor of Meville Mennonite Chapel, uh, the seniors invited him to speak to us. Wish you the Lord's blessing. Thanks very much, Gerald, for that very kind um, introduction. So yes, 30 years ago, uh, things were quite different here around Faith Builders. My hair was a different color. Uh, and a lot of things were just not the way they are today. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord. <clears throat> we're not here to talk about what happened 30 years ago. Uh, we're here to celebrate uh, this commencement, this time of graduation. Uh, and I really am honored that you've given me an opportunity here to say a few words to you. Um, just for whatever it's worth to you, uh, this class is the last class that I taught in algebra, one class too. So uh, the ones that followed have, have been taught by somebody else, but I'm glad to see you now graduated or graduate about to. So praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, much impressed here, but what's already been said, I, we could sit down and just simply take what we've heard from uh, the seven persons who are about to graduate, and we would have enough to think on for a while. I, I might say that I've been saying of late, or Sheila and I, I've been telling Sheila, I'm about ready to walk off the stage and others to walk on the stage. So it was good to see uh, you folks, step up here and talk. I'm thinking of your class motto and the verse that has been suggested or that they have uh, adopted as their class verse. So, in humility, serving one another with love. You know, much is made of the, of the generation gap, and I've already talked just a little bit about that. Um, changes and rapid changes. You're seniors and some of us have become seniors here in recent years and, and uh, we're, we're uh, struggling with changes, 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 changes. But you know what? There are some things that never change. They're always the same. They have been the same ever since the very beginning. And so these words that you, that you have put together here are, are words that don't change. They're the same today as they have ever been. They're the same for you as they were for me and for my dad and my granddad. Humility, serving, love. And you talked about this a bit. <clears throat> and I would just underscore them. Why do we talk about a generation gap? <laughs> these are all, this, these are human, this is human experience. These are the things that we learn. I'm still learning them, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Uh, but I invite you to the same journey of learning something about humility, serving, and love. So for 2,000 years, these words have been the core definitions of Christianity uh, in many, many, many respects. They've defined uh, the, the attributes, the characteristics that uh, we, we read about in Scripture and that we desire to embrace and grow in. <clears throat> and they have been exemplified 
by the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over. I sometimes say these days that, you know, he wins the argument who defines the term. Uh, and so it's not that it's only Christians that use the term humility or serving or love for sure. <laughs> that one gets tossed all over the place. But an awful lot depends on what you mean by them. Well, what is the definition anyway? I'm actually not going to try hard to define them. Uh, the best, the very best definition we have of those terms is found in the person of Jesus Christ himself. So it's in a person. It's in a way of living, in a way of doing things. And hence, when our culture uses the word love, they often means, mean just something like, oh, I don't know, tolerance or be okay with this or that or the other thing. I, I, it, or maybe something even worse. But Jesus never defined it that way by the way he lived. And so I point us in that direction. Bear with me. I had you for algebra and not history, but just a short history lesson here. And I'll be brief about it, I think. Um, one fatal flaw, I think, the fatal flaw that has raised the greatest heresy in all of Christian history and you know what, I'm probably stretching the point there a little bit. The greatest heresies are about the person of Christ himself. But a fatal flaw lies in this humility-serving love triad that Christianity has, I think, made a big mistake on. Uh, I'll jump in at Constantine and just mention him and then jump forward real fast to the Crusades. It is real. You know, right now as I'm speaking to you in Gaza, uh, in the Middle East, there is, a, there is a great tragedy unfolding from what I can tell. I'm not sure what all that means, but back in the Crusades, it was terrible too. In the name of Christ, and I can, I can hardly imagine this, but so what did the Crusaders do? They, they put a symbol of the cross on their shoulder and on their shields and other ways like that. They went marching down there, and as the stories are told, they slaughtered people in the streets until, until the blood ran in rivers, in streams, down the streets, all in the name of Christ. Humility? Serving? Love? What kind of definition is that? By Christians, mind you. So I, I'm wanting to say, be careful how you define the term and always use the Lord Jesus. If we just advanced a little further after the Crusades, and those who've had me for history know where I'm headed here. <laughs> in my opinion, the great turn in Western society, in Western civilization, away from a Bible-based Christian framework. Listen, I'm not trying to make it all Christian. I'm just saying that turn away. Uh, certainly, you can't miss it. Did you see the Crusades and immediately following it? Renaissance, Reformation, Scientific Revolution, Enlightenment. Uh, and again, we could pontificate on those for a while, but they follow immediately. It appears to me as though intelligent men and women of the day gave up on Christianity. They just said, what? <laughs> I would have. If that would have been the definition of Christianity, I would have said, what are we doing? What are we thinking? <laughs> what did Jesus teach? And here I am, imagine it. I'm on a horse with, I've got this armor, and I'm loaded down with the armor, and I'm going down through the streets, slaughtering people in the name of Christ. <laughs> no wonder people gave up on the church. They were followed soon by some German philosophers probably Hegel being one of the, the most representative of them. There are others as well. And, and it's interesting to read what they begin to say, because uh, they don't even use the terminology humility, serving, and love anymore. They, they talk about progress being couched in debate and in mutual antagonism and in conflict and in struggle. And I, heard, I hope you heard me right. This is a definition of progress. This is the way you actually make progress coming out of the 17th, 18th centuries, German philosophers. Uh, 
I still am of the opinion that they had given up on the Christianity that they were observing and turned to something else. And they began to just look around them and they actually began to view struggle as being at the root of progress. Now, there is a certain sense in which we struggle personally, but they meant by that uh, debate, mutual antagonism, conflict, and so on. Probably the benchmark of that stream of thought then was brought together in popular culture by Charles Darwin in 1859 when he wrote the book On the Origin of Species. When that text came out, uh, this seemed to confirm that, in fact, it's true that what progress, progress, mind you, get the word progress, is couched in survival of the fittest, is couched in natural selection, is couched in struggle. So I, it, this is a humility, serving, love at the core of what the universe is about, uh, is what I understand my Bible to say. Uh, and here we just gave up on that and we're quite convinced it's all about struggle. And likely the person who epitomized that the most coming into the 20th century, although he died in 1900, was, uh, was Nietzsche. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before or not, but people who are somewhat familiar with him. And Nietzsche uh, totally, uh, probably was the most honest person in respect to this new way of seeing things. Uh, he said things like this, and I, I'm just... It's not what he said, but I'm, I'm drawing this quote from a book somewhere, and I don't have the, the, uh, the, the source here. Remember that Nietzsche was a staunch opponent of Christianity. He opposed for several reasons. He taught that Christianity weakened the capacity of man by teaching such things as selflessness, humility, and love. See, he openly said that. He said, come on, you can see who the real men are. <laughs> the real men stand up, put up their dukes, and knock down the people who get in their way. And they make progress. That's Nietzsche. He loathed Christianity because he believed it was for weak people. He hated the way the God of the Bible took such an offense at the pride of man. He believed the Christian attack on pride was actually just a mask to, weak, uh, to mask the weakness of humility in Christian faith. That was Nietzsche. And people have swallowed that line like you wouldn't believe in one way or another. One step farther, perhaps, was Bernhardi, a German military officer during World War I, literally said this, war is a biological necessity to progress. It's the way that you knock out the weak and you keep the strong in you progress. You make, you get somewhere. <clears throat> I, he died in 1900. And uh, <clears throat> it's very, very obvious to people who have studied this a bit that German Nazism and Adolf Hitler simply worked right straight off of the thinking of these men. It made all the sense in the world. If you read a little bit of Nietzsche, you pick up on that. But I want to tell you something. Nietzsche was wrong. He was as wrong. I don't know if I can make it strong enough. He was, Christianity is not for wimps. <laughs> Following Christ is not for the weak. Uh, it's for real men, and it's for real women. You will need to summon all the strength and all of the courage and all of the manliness and all of the feminine power that you ladies have. You'll need to summon it all. Uh, and if you intend to actually make progress in your Christian life, Nietzsche was wrong. I can give witness to that in my own experience. Listen, we are in a cosmic battle. <laughs> it is true that there is a struggle. That's true. Uh, uh, but that struggle is way bigger than Nietzsche had ever even thought of, apparently. Uh, it's a cosmic struggle. You know the words of Scripture. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, wrestling sounds like a fighting term to me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. 
against rulers of this world. Uh, things we can't see, we can't feel, we can't touch. We're in, we're in a great struggle, way more than Nietzsche could ever imagine. And what he didn't know <laughs> is the secret to actually fighting that battle was indeed embodied by what the Lord Jesus said in what our Bibles teach us about that struggle. There are two battles I want to mention to you that are a part of this cosmic struggle that you must come to terms with. The first one is, in fact, a battle of the heart. Who has your heart? Is a, a, a basic primary question. I don't know who had Nietzsche's heart, but I know one thing. He didn't have, he, he was not, he didn't have a heart for God. That was for sure. But you must somewhere battle in your, in the heart. And this is a different battle than trying to become the chancellor of Germany or some other uh, great person of that nature. It's, it's something that you can't get your fingers on. But the, the people who win the battle of the heart are the people who find space for progress in their personal lives and find a place to make a contribution to the world that they live in. And then in keeping with an educational institution and a time of graduation is the battle of the mind. <laughs> the battle of the heart. Where's your heart? The battle of the mind. 50, you know, well, where am I at here now? 51 years ago, I graduated from high school, a public school, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And I, for all intents and purposes, it was not a bad school. It had its issues like public schools had. Uh, but I learned a lot there, uh, I, but I especially recognized after I was out of school for a number of years, the battle of the mind. Now, sometimes when we talk about conversion, we think it's strictly a battle of the heart, and it is in many, many ways, but I remind you of a passage that we're very familiar with, Romans chapter 12, so don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, transformed by the renewing of your mind. That sounds like a conversion term to me. It sounds like something that there's change, there's progress. And on a day when you're graduating, it's appropriate to talk about this idea of the transformation of the mind. And to set into context, a proper context, the discussion that we've been having here uh, on Nietzscheism versus what it means to follow God, I, Paul instructs us very, very richly here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to read a first couple of verses, and I think it's appropriate in a setting like this when we're thinking about education and graduation and all of that. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Thinking of power and the tools to change your world. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? The Nietzsche's, if you please. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. When I get tired of preaching, I take a little courage in that. God did decide that by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, for the Jews require a sign and the Jews seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men in the weakness of God is stronger than men. I told you that our definitions need to be defined by Christ. The mystery of the ages, according to Paul, 
in according to our Bibles, kept a mystery from the beginning of the world, not even not revealed even in the Old Testament, but not until the New Testament. The great mystery was the wisdom of the cross that and the birth of the body of Christ, the church. <laughs> and the scriptures even say that if, if the powers that be had known about that mystery, they wouldn't have killed him. But they didn't. <laughs> and there's the, there's the wisdom that you need to carry with you. The real wisdom that leads toward progress is, in fact, humility serving love. <clears throat> as defined by the life and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm telling you, you're in a cosmic battle. Don't have time to do this, but in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 18, put on the whole armor of God. Gird yourself for battle. So, so Nietzsche doesn't want us just to be wimps. Well, we're not wimps. We're called to the battle. Yeah, and we're given rich instruction there. I'll let your pastors work on that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, fight the good fight of faith. There you go. If you want to fight, then think about faith. There is a fight. It's called the fight of faith. Brothers and sisters, I see some people here in this congregation. I see you, Brother John, sitting back there. Folks who are older than I am, uh, I, I, I listen. Just in case you're wondering, I'm pretty sure I'm right. All of us who are 68 and older have had those moments when it felt like everything was going down the tube. It's like, it's all over. <laughs> it's finished. I just, I, I'd like Paul's admonition, fight a good fight of faith. And I would call us all to that great battle that is the fight of faith. I'll close with just a simple story and illustration that most of you likely are somewhat familiar with already that would illustrate some of these ideas here. So Eric Little, uh, 1902 to 1945, and yet guess why I thought of him? You guys out there trotting around that track like you were crazy. Uh, and and uh, the gals are doing it too and a few things like that. that Eric Little was a runner back in the early 20th century. Uh, in fact, good enough that he ran in the 1924 Olympics. Interestingly enough, born in China to a, uh, to a missionary family. Um, crossed the, as a young man, came to Scotland, went to school in Scotland, and uh, there he, he excelled as an athlete, and not only as a sprinter, but in many rugby and a number of other uh, sports as well, good enough to, to run in the 1924 Olympics. He was expected to win, or he was the favorite to win the 100-yard dash. Problem. The 100-yard dash was scheduled to be run on Sunday. All right. I know we have our differing opinions about how you keep the Lord's Day, and, and, and uh, I might even think that Eric Little was far too tight with his thinking. I, you know what? Even if people are a little tight, I have always admired uh, the courage and the conviction to stand by what I believe God has told me to do no matter what. And so here was an opportunity for a man to become, I mean, it was his day in the sun <laughs> uh, to, to run and win the race and get all of the medals and everything that went along with it. But he said, I'm not, I'm sorry, I, I will not run on Sunday, period. <laughs> uh, the result was he did not, of course, uh, win the 100-yard relay. Now, to be really fair with you, though, he went on to run in the 400-yard uh, uh, race and actually won. They didn't expect him to, but he did. But I just want you to hear that piece about his conviction. The battle of the heart, the battle of the, mo the, battle of the mind, conviction. Men and women who will stand firm in our day no matter what. 
But that story doesn't end there. That's a piece that is, has become popularized uh, around the world in many, many ways. Uh, in 1925, Eric Little went to China himself, back to China to be a, a missionary. Um, and he married, he had a couple of children. World War II came along. And if you know a little bit about World War II, Jap uh, China is, is occupied by Japan, and Japan is pretty brutal in their occupation of China. So China Inland Mission, other missionaries were in great danger. Eric Little sent his wife and family home, but he stayed in, um, in China. In, uh, it, it, as you might expect, the workers were very short. They were short on workers. They needed a lot of help. And he said, I'm staying. He was not really captured, but forced into an internment camp in Japan. I'm sorry, in China by the Japanese. And uh, just a few months before liberation, uh, the liberation of China, he died. 43 years old. Humility, serving, love is in your motto, the verse that you have given. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So, as you think on these things, I invite you to the great cosmic battle, the cause of Christ, the kingdom of God, the, the church that you belong to, work hard for the Lord Jesus. And in the words of the great song that was written some years ago, the way of the cross leads home. God bless you. Thank you, brother, for those words. I feel privileged that we had a white-haired man who's lived life well share with you and, and all of us. In humility, serving others with love. The battle of the heart, the battle of the mind. We have a little bit of unfinished business here yet, I think. So we should probably take care of that. Mr. Brubaker, would you come forward? Faith Builders Christian School awards a high school diploma in general studies. This diploma represents a number of things. 12 years of commitment and hard work. Support, dedication of parents and family, church family, school staff. It's not only the completion of a required set of courses, but also the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding reveals Christ and attempts to equip these men and women for a life of humble service in the kingdom of God through the local body of believers, the church. And so, Mr. Brubaker, I have examined the records of this graduating class, and I find that they have fulfilled the requirements for graduation in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the requirements of Faith Builders Christian School. Therefore, it is with great pleasure that I recommend the following students for graduation. Graduating class, please rise, take your places. Travis Hirschberger. Christian Thane Kaufman.
Alex Trenton Miller. Andre Lane Miller. Maya Lynn Schmucker. <laughs> Nicholas Hans Stolzfus. Shelby Danae Wenger. <laughs> Join me in applauding this class for their accomplishment, the class of 2024. I would ask you to join me by rising as we pray a blessing on this group. <clears throat> Father, this, this group of people that love these seven friends, family, uh, we're gathered here and we're gathered with uh, heads bowed to you because we recognize that they were able to successfully complete these 12 years of study because of your grace and your presence and your people and your love. And now we gather uh, before you to ask that you would continue growing and nurturing and forming them into people who passionately pursue you and your holiness. We ask you to arrange the circumstances of their lives moving forward to continue to cultivate a, a burning heart for you, for truth, and for all that is genuinely good. Lord, we ask you to enable them to extend the range of your effective will in the world. May your kingdom come in them. May your will be done in them. And may they help to fill the earth with the knowledge of your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Lord, we are thy people, come down by thy love. O teach us compassion, through Jesus our Son. Lord, we are 
An evening like this always brings this mixture of emotion, um, emotions that are part of celebration. And uh, to you graduates, uh, one last shot. You're about to step forward into something new, and the kinds of things you were called, uh, that were called from you in school is not that different from what will be called from you in your vocation as you step into the next phase of your life. But in leaving school, don't go in the strength of your education. Go in the strength of the Lord. Hopefully grateful for the training and equipping, but relying on the Holy Spirit and the life of Jesus. We discussed this year the, the, uh, the power of silence and wander and worship some of our chapels with our school theme. And the story of Elijah is a powerful example. I want to remind you of that this evening. Ahab was a very evil king. He set up Baal as a god to worship. And, and God had Elijah bear the bad news of this, of, of this incredibly evil king, King Ahab, about this drought as a result of his wickedness. Several years of drought and Elijah goes back to Ahab and he asks for 850 prophets, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah to meet him on Mount Carmel. And Elijah offered the challenge, if Baal is God, follow him. If God is God, follow him. We know the story of how God showed up on Mount Carmel, burned the sacrifice and the water around the altar, an amazing miracle. And the people's response was, the Lord, he is God. Soon after, there was a small cloud that began to show itself. And finally, after three long years, the wind came up and heavenly heavy rain falls from the sky. Well, Jezebel, here's how the prophets of Baal and Asherah were killed and was incensed by it and made it clear that Elijah would be killed as well. He was afraid. He ran for his life. And God miraculously gave him a meal that sustained him for 40 days and nights as he traveled to escape the fury of Jezebel. He made it to a cave, and he was there licking his wounds, as it were. And while he was there, word of the Lord came to him. And God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. But the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me, too. God said, well, go stand out on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for, for the Lord's going to pass by. Elijah goes out. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God came and gave Elijah his next instruction. I don't think God's into the flashy stuff necessarily. In the simple silence, Elijah found God. Our world has so much coming at us. There is so much noise, so many mediums. And it's easy to forget that silence is where we often hear God. When the other voices are so loud. Culture wants us to fill that silence. But remember, God's okay with some silence. As you leave here, I encourage you to be focused on hearing God, to not let the voices of culture drown out the still small voice of God wanting to commune with you, wanting to raise you up to really make a difference. Be still and know that I am God. While a significant portion of your formal training might be completed here, I pray that you would never stop learning, never stop growing.
Never stop becoming more and more like the Jesus you love. Be strong and of good courage. Jesus is able to take this excellent start and do his work in your life until the day he will carry you safely to the home he has prepared for you in his eternal kingdom. This is a commencement. You are beginning. You have been given much. Much will be required of each of you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because the Lord has anointed you to enlarge his kingdom, to show other people the cross, to preach good tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open prisons to those who are bound. Go and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Give others beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that the Lord Jesus be glorified. Give to life. Give to God and give to others what you have been given so that when you come before a holy God at the end of your life, and none of us knows when that will be, you will hear the words, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Be strong, be courageous, Don't be afraid or be discouraged, for the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. Therefore, go forth. Let's stand for a benedictory prayer. Father, the conclusion of this ceremony, I'm asking your special grace to be with these seven. I ask that you would Give them what they need as they go. Help them to go forth in your strength. Help them to serve. Help them to be what you've called them to be. And now as we celebrate around food and the enjoyment of fellowship with each other and and of fellowship with with the students, I just pray for Uh, Just many good moments here for the next several hours as we uh, celebrate the accomplishments and the goodness and the faithfulness of you, our God and Savior. Thank you for each one that's here, for what they mean to this group, for the blessing they've been, for the part they've played in the accomplishments of this group. None of these are self-made men and women. And so I ask that you would bless our evening here together. In Jesus' name, amen.